So it's come to this. What Trump has in common with the last German emperor. Now I know, I know, it's just a channel icon. It's not really anything I should take really seriously, but... I mean, come on, I have to address this. <clears throat> President Donald Trump appears sui generis. Other troublesome populists, me dictators, like Rodrigo Duterte of the Philippines, hold power. I mean, you're already, you're already intellectually dishonest. Comparing Trump to a dictator like Duterte is wrong. But no other nation of great influence is governed by someone so little rooted in reality and so much dominated by personality. And I'll give you the second one, but no, Trump is more or less rooted in reality. Perhaps a bit too much, so... Uh, is there such a thing as being too down-to-earth or too brash? Maybe. But at least he's not like people like you who are completely alien from reality. Who think, oh, mass immigration's perfectly fine. There's no ill effects of it. Islam's a religion of peace. Oh, look, we can blame white people and say they're all racist for years and years and years, and then we're surprised when they don't vote for us. But anyways... <clears throat> However, the president has a historical soulmate who ruled a century ago. Yeah, William Jennings Bryan, the populist, anti-imperialist, anti-interventionist, America first candidate in the early 1900s, who ran more or less against sort of, you know, big businesses, he was for sort of the common working man, against the sort of internationalist politic of Woodrow Wilson. That's a very, that's a, if you're going to talk in terms of policies and somebody who's actually an American politician, that's who you should be going for. The similarities are striking, though their lives obviously differed in important ways. One wonders, was the German Empire's Kaiser Wilhelm II reincarnated as President Trump? Exactly. One wonders. That one is you, because no one else but you is this crazy. <clears throat> Wilhelm II was born in 1859 in the House of Hohenzollern, a grandson of Queen Victoria. He grew up in a life of wealth and privilege, though he suffered from a withered ar left arm as a result of a birth injury. This may well have contributed to a psychological need for affirmation, a subject that Thomas Mann deftly explored in his novel Royal Highness. Now, I've already read this article before, uh, and the thing is, it just goes on a lot about just a, bi a brief biography of the Kaiser, and it's sort of the main narrative you hear that he was this, you know, always wanted attention because of everything that happened in his past has to determine everything he does later in life, because, God forbid, he has any free agency of his own, and Lord knows you're not going to use the same psychoanalysis on any other contemporary leader at the time, not the Tsar, not Roosevelt, not the King, not King George, no, just the Kaiser. But, so yeah, if I go off topic, I'm probably not going to talk that much about Trump in this. It's just going to be more on, you know, the Kaiser and the false narrative we're given. He took power in 1888 after the death of his grandfather and father. Wilhelm rejected the liberal views of his parents. His mother was British and unpopular among German conservative circles. She was also a sort of heartless bitch and favored traditional autocracy. Also, he was determined to rule as well as reign. In contrast, his gra grandfather, Kaiser Wilhelm I, well, he was an old man anyways, had mostly left governing to the famed Iron Chancellor Otto von Bismarck. Still, Wilhelm was no dictator. Yeah, Bismarck was. Now, certainly, yeah, Bismarck was great. He unified Germany and helped establish sort of a uh, new diplomatic order that had, that had a place for a united Germany. But he was a dictator, and Wilhelm actually helped... Wilhelm is an example of a monarch, a sovereign, working, using his monarchical powers to depose a dictator. Because the story is that around the time he deposed Bismarck, Bismarck essentially just wanted to send in the German army or the Prussian army into Westphalia or the Rhineland, where there was a workers' strike going on, and basically just shoot them. This would have caused a civil war of socialist working classes in Germany against the Prussian military. Wilhelm did the opposite. He did the smart and sensible thing in, in uh, helping acquiesce to their, to their demands, giving better working conditions, and helping start a path of more social reform. That's something he was actually known for until the First World War. 
Germany had a strong constitutional order and an elected Reichstag with, broad fr with a broader franchise than Great Britain. However, the cabinet answered to the Kaiser, not the parliament. In that sense, Imperial Germany looked a lot like modern-day America, where the president is both head of state and government and thereby manages the executive branch in contrast to the Westminster parliamentary rule. No. No. Do you know how America and Germany are similar? Decentralization. They're both historically federal nations. Even Imperial Germany, the Constitution explicitly says it's a confederation or a federal monarchy of various sovereign, semi-sovereign states. Like, there is still a Kingdom of Bavaria, Kingdom of Saxony, free imperial cities, uh, and the Kingdom under the Kingdom of Prussia. America has, and you know, this differs from a country like France, where everything is mostly just sort of concentrated in and around Paris. In Germany and America, you have it sort of decentralized, a lot more autonomy to the uh, to the states, and because of that, or in part because of that, you get uh, numerous great cities in America instead of sort of just this one central one like Paris is. So, you know, in America, you've got like Chicago, New York, and uh, Philadelphia, or uh, Los Angeles, Seattle. In Germany, you've got you know Bonn, Cologne, Frankfurt, and Berlin, and Munich. So, yeah, decentralized forms of government, that's what we have in common. Not our executive system. That's insane. You idiot. The German Empire was not a superpower, was on the road to be, but it was a rising great power. It possessed the world's second largest economy, surpassed Britain in industrial strength, and enjoyed a substantially larger population than France. The German army was the world's best army. Kaiser Wilhelm's attempt to match the British Navy Naval strength failed, but the potent Kriegsmarine could not be ignored by London. Berlin also acquired a small network of overseas colonies. The Kaiser was particularly interested in international affairs. He dismissed Bismarck in 1890 and embarked upon what he termed the new course. Bismarck was no liberal peacenik, but once he unified Germany and consolidated the empire's gains, he sought stability. So did the Kaiser. <clears throat> he was uninterested in colonies, opposed he actually was interested in colonies, the Berlin Conference, which helped partition Africa effectively among the European powers, was in 1884, in Berlin, led by Bismarck, and sought to keep opposed the naval race with Great Britain, because Germany didn't have a navy, and he sought to keep France and Russia apart. The problem is that that's not something that you could do indefinitely. There's evidence that uh, documentation from the late 19th century that France and Russia were planning to ally for the explicit purpose of destroying or at least heavily weakening Germany. Had his policies remained in place, he died in 1898. He can't live forever. <laughs> World War I would have certainly not have erupted in August 1914. You don't know that. None of us know that. And to blame it all on the Kaiser... And to blame all of the Kaiser's actions on the fact that he had a withered left arm is ridiculous and insane and insulting. <clears throat> Bismarck famously observed that the Balkans were not worth the bones of a single Pomeranian grenadier. He was right. <clears throat> Wilhelm was aggressive, thoughtless. Mm, no, it said he was quite smart, and you're probably going to contradict this later in this article by saying there's a description that he was actually intelligent. And extraordinarily maladroit. He earned a lengthy litany of criticisms. Yeah, because all the praise he had received, the military honors and the title of the Peace Kaiser that the New York Times gave him, and all the social reforms he helped implement, <clears throat> were shadowed by the Allies calling him Satan during the war. Calling the, your enemy Satan. Hmm. Or the essentially the worst possible thing you can imagine, because Hitler doesn't exist yet. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Anyways, yeah, uh, he grew up to be emotionally needy, bombastic, choleric, hyperactive, and hypersensitive. His personality combined with the militaristic authoritarian culture of the Prussian court to create a monarch who was extraordinarily ill-suited to be the most powerful country in Europe. Lies. And nonsense. Prussia is not a two-dimensional cartoon villain of a country. They were a very, very advanced culturally advanced and developed country they just had a strong military because they're located in central europe bordered by austria to the south 
France to the west, Sweden to the north, and Russia to the east. You need a military if you want to survive in this. And also, this is the country which helped out, which also abolished slavery, was one of the first countries to recognize American independence, uh, helped institute some of the earliest child labor laws, had a constitution, and was the home of numerous, you know, numerous philosophers, artists, writers, and musicians like, like Humboldt, like <clears throat> Hegel, and like Kant. And he was not ill-suited to lead Germany. If he had died in 1914, he would most likely just be remembered as the Kaiser who kept the peace that had been established through Bismarck and improved the working conditions and living conditions of his people. He would have been remembered fairly fondly, if not a little, you know, bit of a side note. And here's a story about how he wasn't this evil monster that everyone thinks he is. In Norway, there's a small city called Alizund, I think that's what it's called, where the Kaiser used to like to hunt. Now, in 1904, Alizund had a major fire. It left thousands of people homeless. Do you know what the first, do you know who, do you know what was the first country to respond to this? Germany, at the behests of the Kaiser, because he liked to hunt there. He immediately sent four battleships loaded with supplies to the town, and they immediately started deploying temporary shelters and rebuilding the city while it was still smoking. Does that sound like a bad person to you? Mm-mm. Thomas Nipperday called the Kaiser gifted. Yeah, so it's not so he's thoughtless and gifted as in, in terms of intelligence, right? But also superficial, hasty, restless, unable to relax without any deeper level of serious without any desire for hard work or drive to see things. He constantly wanted to meddle in affairs. What do you mean he didn't want to do hard work? Without any sense of sobriety for balance and boundaries. Please read an actual biography of him. Try Christopher Clark or Miranda Carter. They made really good biographies that actually show a much more realistic and balanced view of this person. <clears throat> Uncontrollable and scarcely capable of learning from experience, desperate for applause and success. That sounds an awful lot like the occupant of the White House. Yeah, and if you look at your horoscope, depend, no matter which one it is, you can find a way to make it sound like you. This is complete conjecture and projection, and it's ridiculous. I mean, who is this article for? I mean, what's the point? All you're doing is going, hey, here are some traits of a guy who we don't like because of a narrative we've been fed about history. Uh, he's like Trump. Yeah, but the guy lived a hundred years ago in Germany. This is a completely different situation, and I don't understand how it helps us in any way or what, what possible way it's supposed to benefit us to, you know, understand that the two were similar. I mean, what, did you just run out of saying, oh, he's like Hitler, he's like Hitler, he's like Hitler. All right, that doesn't work. Well, he's just like the Kaiser, but... Not that many people even know who he is anymore, the Kaiser. Whatever. Kaiser Wilhelm insisted on making Germany great again. I'm a place in the sun. By fair means or foul. No, no. He said we don't want to overshadow anybody else, so not foul. He was, and they used the German, Imperial Germany used the same tactics the British did, but probably a lot less because, you know, oh, Germany invades Belgium. That's terrible. Britain invades Greece in World War One. Britain... Uh, invades most of invades half of Africa, India, Australia, and the New World. Oh, that's fine. That's fine. <clears throat> there was no Twitter hashtag make the Kaiser great again, but in 1895 the Kaiser dispatched an, uncur an encouraging telegram to the Boers who were resisting British troops in the Transvaal. This won him neither Germany nor him. This neither won him nor Germany any friends or plaudits across the English Channel. It did win them friends in France, who almost wa wanted to ally with them, were it not, and they would have, were it not for the intervention of Queen Victoria. In 1900, German soldiers joined an international expedition to suppress an anti-Western boxer rebellion in China. He told them, just as a thousand years ago, blah blah blah, Hun speech, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, trying to rally your troops and, you know, uh, make them feel strong, that's just, that's just an awful, horrible thing that no leader ever does, and, you know, I mean... You know who, the, especially considering that, you know, in the Boxer Rebellion, 
the country that sent the most troops there was the Japanese. So moving on. Five years later, he inflamed tensions with France by visiting Morocco and backing the kingdom's independence against Paris. So he was an anti-imperialist? He also, his conduct also offended friendly states and lost Berlin support at the International Conference called to defuse the crisis. In 1908, he gave an indiscreet, boastful, condescending interview in the Telegraph, a leading British newspaper. Okay, so what? He spoke his mind? I mean, if you're going to compare him to Trump, the thing is, a lot of these traits that people sort of blame Trump for having, that's a lot of what people like about him, that he's brash, that he doesn't really seem to care what other people think. <clears throat> During the European crisis, uh, after the June 28th, 1914 assassination of Franz Ferdinand, something that was partially coordinated by the Serbian government, it was completely their fault, uh, Wilhelm pushed for an aggressive response before unsuccessfully attempting to halt the rush to war with the famous Vili Nikki telegram to his cousin, Russian Tsar Nicholas II the actual winner of the most incompetent ruler in Europe. The guy who thought, hey, the peasants are revolting, working conditions are awful, should we make reforms? No, let's just go to war with Japan, that'll work. When they lose that, hmm, that didn't work. Let's just go to war with Germany, that'll work even better. But I think it was said that uh, Nikki was fit to, was only fit to rule a, you know, an easygoing country estate it, only if he had Huge amounts of help from a bunch of assistants. <clears throat> Wilhelm got sidelined during the war and forced to abdicate after Germany was forced into doing it because they were being starved to death by the Allies. A million Germans starved to death by that blockade, Britain. Uh, even though Germany throughout 1917 and 18 was more than willing to make favorable peace conditions... Eric von Ludendorff and Hindenburg ran the show. Wilhelm lived out his life in exile in the Netherlands and died in 1941. In both personality and lack of discretion, the Kaiser and the Donald seem to have a lot in common. So what? I mean, I think that's that's the thing, isn't it? I mean, so what? What does this matter? <laughs> Thankfully, history repeat doesn't repeat itself. Yeah. So this doesn't matter. <laughs> but the two remind us of the truth of abolitionist Wendell Phillips' observation, the eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. Yeah, except for the vigilance during World War I that America was supposed to have should have been directed internally at the corrupt criminal psychopath of Woodrow Wilson, complete, who was in bed with American banking interests, which were loading money to the Allies, and that's what caused us to go into World War I. No, instead the vigilance was against an evil Kaiser who people actually liked, and before the war you called the Peace Kaiser. People didn't actually seem to hate him during before the war, and had no interest in invading America. America has a more powerful legislature, an active opposition, and developed better developed society than Imperial Germany. Debatable. All of which should help to hold President Trump in check if his more dubious personality traits lead to trouble. Nevertheless, the president has presidency has a mass extraordinary authority because of people like Obama. Congressional Republicans so far have been largely parsimonious and understandable popular anger against institutions such as the media undercut their influence. No, it's not that they undercut their influence, it's that they don't stop lying. That they're completely the they're the they're the media wing of the Democrats and the progressives, and everyone knows it and you don't stop lying. One need not look to history to recognize that the next four years are likely to prove challenging, but Trump's closest historical model suggests the urgency of protecting, protecting, uh, preparing an effective nonpartisan opposition. Surely this is a time to be vigilant in defense of freedom. Okay, so if we don't need to look to history, if history doesn't repeat itself, and all you did was conflate and compare the two's personalities... What was the point of this? I mean, <clears throat> again, who is this for? <laughs> it's like, all right, historians or people interested in history. No, this just pissed me off. I mean, the average person doesn't know who the Kaiser is. I mean, what on earth was the point? <laughs> but anyways, uh, yeah, 
this guy's an idiot. I don't understand. I think he just wanted the clicks. Whatever. But, uh, make America great again, I guess. Anyways, I'm working on my next uh, response video. It should come out in a few days, hopefully. This is just to tide you over. Tell me if you actually like this format being very honest and uh, straightforward and unscripted. Uh, I guess I'll see you guys later. Diabana, have a good day.